Hey, welcome back to Computer Science Theory. This is Tom's W3261, offered Summer B 2021 at Columbia University. And this is Lecture 7, Part 1, where we're going to talk about the um, equivalence of CFGs, that is context free grammars, the new tool we've been talking about for about a week, and push down automata, the new automata we saw starting last lecture. It's going to turn out that both of these recognize the con context free languages, precisely that class of languages. So CFGs recognize the context free languages by definition. That's precisely what we said they were. Context free languages are all the languages that are described by some CFG. Uh, but it's not obvious that push down automata recognize precisely these languages. So a big part of today's lecture is going to be this if and only if proof where we show uh, equivalence here. We'll also go on to talk about non-context-free languages. That is, languages that are not context-free. So these will be languages, clearly they're not regular because the regular languages are a subset of the context-free languages. They're going to be even more fun and exotic than languages we've seen so far. Harder to recognize, harder to pin down, and more interesting. So we're working our way up in the world. But let's start with a teaser. The teaser is what language does this push down automaton recognize? So I'm going to start by drawing a state diagram. Then you can pause the video and try to figure out, OK, what language does this recognize? Maybe try some strings, or maybe just stare at the diagram and try to analyze what accepting strings might look like. Then I'm going to come back and explain how I might break it down. This is what our push down automaton will look like. We have Q1 is a start state. From Q1, we have exactly one outgoing edge that may look familiar. That will take us to Q2. We may hang out in Q2 for a while, taking one of these two edges, transitions that um, read in things and push things, but keep us in Q2. Um, then eventually, we'll follow this transition and go to state Q3, where again, we might hang out for a while. This time, as we read in things, we'll pop characters off the stack. And finally, we will take this last edge over to our single accept state, Q4. So that is a state diagram for a push down automaton. I want to remind you that whenever you see this new transition notation, this first one is the input symbol you read. This is what you pop off the stack. And this is what you push onto the stack. So that's the only bit of notation that was new last time. Otherwise, these things behave relatively similarly to an NFA or a DFA. We're just also keeping track of the stack state as we go. And of course, we can't have non-deterministic branches. So if you want to take a crack at this, pause the video now. And if not, I'll come back and explain it. So I could certainly track strings through this. In particular, this particular pushdown automaton is not going to create a lot of non-deterministic branches. So it's relatively feasible to put strings through and just see what happens. But I also noticed from looking at it that any accepting string has to pass through the states Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 in that order. So I can actually write down an informal set of steps that all accepting strings have to pass through. And I can use those to deduce the language of this PDA. So let's do that. Uh, step one, we go to Q1. We have to take this transition to Q2, which means we push a dollar sign onto the stack. Um, the first two empty string symbols 
mean that we don't read any input yet. And we also don't pop anything off the stack, which is good because there's nothing on the stack to pop. All we do is push this dollar sign. And this particular automaton is going to use the dollar sign as we've seen it used before as a marker for the bottom of the stack. Next, as long as we read in A's and B's, we will stay in state Q2. So we'll read in A's and B's from the input. We'll pop nothing, so we have that empty string symbol again. And we'll push a one onto the stack for every A or B that we read. All right? So we don't take that downward edge until we read in a pound sign. So we'll stick around in Q2 for as long as we're reading A's and B's. We won't do any non-deterministic branching yet as long as we see A's and B's. Uh, if we see anything else, of course, our branch will die. The third step, we will take this edge from Q2 down to Q3 as soon as we see a pound. So we'll read in pound sign and we'll leave the state unchanged. Sorry, the stack state unchanged. We don't push or pop anything because we've got empty strings in both of those instruction um, places. Once we're in Q3, we can't transition to Q4 until there's a dollar sign on the top of our stack. And we don't see the dollar sign on top of our stack until we've popped all the ones that are currently cluttering it up. Uh, it's possible that if we didn't push any ones, we could proceed directly to go, except the string. But for some number of rounds, zero or greater, we will read in all this loop from Q3 to Q3. We'll read in A's and B's and pop ones off the stack. And finally, once our stack is exhausted, that is, once we've read in all the ones and all that's left is that dollar sign, we pop the dollar sign and go to state Q4. From state Q4, remember, we never terminate until we've read all the input. So if there's still input to be read, our branch will actually die because there's no outgoing edges from Q4. But if we're done reading input, we accept. So what does an accepting string look like? I mean, clearly, you've got to follow these five steps. Um, we'll push a dollar sign onto the stack. That doesn't matter because it has nothing to do with the input. Then we'll read in some number of A's and B's, pushing ones on the stack the whole time. So clearly an accepting string has to start with some number of A's and B's, although that number could be zero. So I'll write that in regular expression type language. That is, it's either an A or it's a B, and we'll say that there's K of them. Our accepting string will start with K characters of A's and B's for some K greater than or equal to zero. At that point, we go from Q2 to Q3. There has to be pound sign in our input string the transition. Then we're going to pop off some more A's and B's before finally proceeding to Q4. And in particular, um, we'll pop off one, A, one one for every A or B we read in after the pound sign. We only accept if we finish our input string precisely when we empty our stack. That is, if we pop off as many ones as we pushed on, 
We'll pop off as many ones as we pushed on. If we read as many A's and B's before the break, before the pound sign, as we do afterwards. So all of our accepting strings will have the same number of A's and B's on either side of the pound sign, even if the two strings aren't unique. So our language will look like this. All strings that match the pattern A union B to the K, pound sign A union B to the K, for some K greater than or equal to zero. So that's our teaser unpacked. And I hope that's warmed up your brain, gotten you back into the mode of thinking about these cool automata that Shi Chen says are the worst part of CS theory, but don't tell anybody I heard that rumor, because um, I think they're the best part. Okay, as we get started, uh, we need some announcements, as always. I believe the only one for today is that Homework number four is due Monday, 7, 26, 21 at 11.59 p.m. EST. Oh, and I guess um, if, because I've had some questions about this, I know some people have found the homework tough. That's good. That means they're challenging problems. Hopefully they've made you think, even the ones that have made you bash your head against the wall for a while, have given you practice with things like the pumping lemma. So if all the homeworks average below, say, 85%, uh, we may curve some up. So, so far, the means and medians have been hovering in the mid-80s for the homework, which I think is a good target. But in case there is a brutal homework, we will curve it up. We will never curve a homework or a grade down on a homework or test. So do not worry about something getting curved down on you. But you know, we will be relatively compassionate. Nobody will suffer just because there was an impossible problem. Uh, readings for today. So the first part where we talk about the equivalent of pushdown automata to context-free grammars, that is Sipster section 2.2. And then the second part where we talk about non-context-free languages, that is Sipster 2.3. So if you want to read along, that's where to look in the textbook. The agenda for today, we'll start with review, as always. So we'll go over the definition of a PDA, the formal definition, because we'll need to use it in our proof. And it's probably good to see it again, because it's a big old six tuple with a complicated transition function. Um, that always looks scary when you see it for the first time until you realize, OK, we're just mapping three things to some set of new states. And we're tracking the pushing and popping. That's really all we're doing there. Um, then part two, push down automata, recognize precisely the context-free languages. So this will require a proof in two directions. First, we'll show how to convert a context-free grammar into a push down automaton. And then we'll show how to convert Pushdown automaton into a context free grammar. That'll mean any context free language, because it has context free grammar, can be recognized by some PDA. Any language recognized by some PDA uh, can be described by some context free grammar, which means context free. So those will be the two parts and the two directions of that proof. And finally, we'll talk about non context free languages. And we'll introduce a new pumping lemma. So um, this is 
I know the pumping lemma is such a big favorite that we want to see it twice. So we'll see another one. Um, but it'll be easier this time because you've got so much practice with the old one. Let's jump right into it. So first, I'm going to write out the definition of a push down automaton again. If this is still fresh because you just watched the last lecture, you're welcome to skip through. A push down automaton formally written out as a six tuple is a six tuple uh, Q sigma capital gamma delta Q zero F where Q is a finite set of states Uh, sigma and gamma are finite state and stack alphabet. Sorry, not state alphabet. We'll see that later. Input and stack alphabet. That is, sigma will tell you all of the symbols that you might see on the input string. Gamma, which is often larger, but doesn't have to be is everything you can push and pop from the stack. So of course, you know, often you can push and pop symbols that you also might see on the input string, but you can also push and pop fun, fancy stuff like dollar signs to mark the bottom of stacks, or really any other symbols that are convenient for you. If you're designing a push down automaton, feel free to put anything in gamma that makes your life easier. Um, QO is the start state. F, a subset of Q, is the set of accept states. And delta, as always, is our transition function. The complicated thing here is the domain and the range. So uh, delta will take in as input a state. An input symbol for the empty string and a popped stack symbol for the empty string. So this is precisely what we need for a transition function and a push down automaton. Our transition function has three pieces of information when it's trying to tell us where to go. It knows where we are or in some state. It knows what symbol is next on the input tape. And it also knows if it chooses to pop something off the stack, what that symbol was. That is gonna determine where we go next. So where we go next will be some state Q. And we may also choose to push something on the stack. So this is a new state and a symbol to push. Um, it's not quite that simple just because we have non-determinism. So we're perfectly allowed to have multiple edges um, or no edges at all. So instead of mapping to one state, we'll map to all subsets of pairs that match this description. So remember this is the power set. You can read it as all subsets of, meaning this is all subsets of pairs that match that description. So it'll just tell us to go to some set of state symbol pairs rather than some particular state symbol pair. Cool. That's our transition function. As usual, we have rules that tell us what an accepting computation looks like. Previously, our rules for an accepting computation have said, if you want to accept this string, you better have a sequence of states that match up with the transition function that takes me from the start to an accept state. 
uh, this particular definition of an accepting computation will have all that. It just has one additional thing, which is not only do you have to take me from a start state to an accept state that in a way that matches the transition function, but you also better show me a record of what was on the stack that whole time. And the stack behavior better makes sense. So in particular, we'll say, hey, push down a Thomas Hunt, accept the input, uh, the input string W equals W1, W2, dot, 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 WM, where each WI is either a symbol in the input alphabet or the empty string. So these are the sequence of input things we read in corresponding to the states we travel through. If there exists um, sequences of states and strings, so the states of the states we pass through, R0, R1, dot, 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 Rm. These are all states. And the strings, which keep track of what is on the stack, are S0, S1, dot, 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 to Sm. And they better be strings over the stack alphabet. Such that, uh, what conditions do we need our certificate to meet? Well, first, they better start at the start state. That is, the first state in our sequence of states better be the start state. The last state better be an accept state. And the stack better start out empty. Um, next, it has to describe a sequence of valid transitions and stack operations. So in particular, We'll say for all i in 0, 1, dot, 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 to the m minus 1. So for every step, the state we go to, state ri plus 1, and the thing we push on the stack had better be a legal place we can go to from the place we currently are, given what we read in and what we pop off the stack. So this just says the place we go matches our transition function. Moreover, the old stack function, the old stack memory, better have the thing we said we popped off on the top. The new stack better have the thing we pushed on on the top or some stack symbol and um, some string T over the stack alphabet that represents the rest of the stack. So this first condition is saying uh, all these transitions between states should match up with our transition function for some pair A and B of stack symbols that we pop and push. And also uh, our stack beforehand should have the thing we pop on top. Afterwards, it should have the thing we push on top. Right, so that's what a certificate looks like. The sequence of states and the sequence of stack states. I wanna do one more push down automaton example because we've seen a lot of this kind of symmetric counting. And I wanna give you one that's a little bit more complicated than that so you have it to come back and look at. So, Here's another push down automaton example. We will build a PDA that recognizes the language L equals A to the I, B to the J, C to the K for some I, J, and K greater than or equal to zero and i equals j so there's the same number of a's and b's 
or I equals K. There's the same number of A's and C's. So the idea is we will push A's onto the stack, then non-deterministically guess whether to count C's or C's. So in other words, we'll do something kind of similar to our previous PDAs that tested are there the same number of ones and zeros. So we'll count all the A's and then we'll non-deterministically guess whether to count all the B's or to count all the C's. So let me show you how to do that. Uh, we're definitely going to need a start state, Q1. And as usual, we'll start by putting a dollar sign on the bottom to mark the stack N. Then we'll go to state Q2, and we'll do something relatively familiar at this point. We'll say, every time you see an A on the input string, don't pop anything, but push an A on top of the stack. So already, we have a PDA that will push a dollar sign on the stack, and we'll push an A on the stack for every single A at the beginning of our string. We're also gonna do non-deterministic guessing. This should look a lot like our old union or sort of just an OR operation that we've used frequently for NFAs. In particular, this epsilon, epsilon to epsilon transition, this is really just an epsilon edge. It's saying, uh, don't read anything from the input, don't push anything off the stack, and don't pop any, sorry, don't push anything onto the stack, don't pop anything from the stack, just take the edge. So at every point in time, we'll have some branch of our computation hanging out in Q2, and two other branches that take these two epsilon edges and try to count these and try to count these respectively. I'll just annotate here. Yes, we will try to count these up here, and we'll try to count these down here. Okay, so we'll look at this top branch first. At this point, we have pushed a dollar sign on. We've read in some A's. So now we want to read in B's. And every time we read in a B, we push an A off the stack. Uh, note that the state also has the additional effect of cleverly killing off any branches that have guessed the wrong end of the string of A's. So it's entirely possible that my string starts with five A's and I go to state Q2, read in three of them, and then non-deterministically guess that it's time to start reading in some B's and I go to state Q3. Um, if there are still A's on the input string, that branch of computation will die because we won't have any outgoing edges for B. We'll only be able to read B's if we've moved on from A's to B's. So although I don't necessarily count every single case, um, in this design, we do implicitly need to consider uh, making sure no non-deterministic branches end up doing things we don't want them to do. In this particular case, we're only here reading in Bs, um, and the only time we ever leave this state is once we've re read in as many Bs as we previously read in As, at which point we get to pop the dollar sign off the stack we get to try to accept. So read in some A's, read in some B's, uh, pop the dollar sign, and now we are in an accept state. If we still have B's to read, that is if the string of B's is 
longer than the string of A's. So if we still have B's, we'll just die here. The reason I've added this one more edge, state Q4, is because it's certainly possible, legal, necessary, we'll have more C's at the end of our string. And if we've met the condition that the number of A's is equal to the number of B's, we should be accepting. So for as long as we have C's on the input, we'll be able to stay in state Q4, and that'll ensure that uh, after reading an equal number of A's and B's and then some number of C's, we'll wind up in state Q4 with the input all read, and we will accept. The bottom branch is going to be similar. So in this case, I'm non-deterministically guessing that the number of A's and C's is equal. So first, I've got to shuck off all my B's. So I'll create a state Q5 that, that has this edge that says just, if you see a B, pop it off the stack. We'll stay in Q5, popping B's off the stack um, until they're all gone, at which point we will transition to the state where we count these. So at this point, we'll do something that's just like this state up here, where we popped B's, or sorry, popped A's and read B's. Here we read C's and pop A's. Uh, we do have an epsilon transition from Q5 to Q6, but we actually don't have to worry about transitioning early, because if we do, and there are still B's left to read, we'll die as soon as we reach Q6. So at this point, uh, any string that reaches Q6 will have gone from Q1 to Q2, pushed a dollar sign, read in some A's, moved to Q5, ignored all the B's, moved to Q6, popped off an A for every single C, and then finally, once we have reached the end of the stack, we end as we're used to doing by popping off the dollar sign and winding up safely in Q7. We still have C's to read or any other characters, our branch will die, but if our input string has ended at the same time as we've finished popping off A's and reading C's, we know the number of A's and C's are equal, so we'll accept there. So I hope you, that I've convinced you that some branch accepts in state Q4 if the number of A's and B's is equal. Some branch accepts in state Q7 if the number of B's and C's is equal. Um, by the rules of non-determinism, all we need is one accepting branch of computation to accept. So we will accept if the number of A's equals the number of B's or number of A's equals the number of C. So slightly longer construction there. A little bit more work, but the individual pieces are not too bad. Um, we made a non-deterministic choice. We showed how to do things like uh, create little loops that take things off the stack while ignoring them or while counting them, and eventually how to accept if and only if two strings are equal length in our input substrings for input are equal. Um, I will do one test of string. Let's test case you're watching this example and you're like, oh no, I'm confused. I lost you halfway. Through. I've watched it three times and I'm having trouble understanding how this PDA works. Let's run through what happens on the test string AABCC and we'll consider only one accepting branch. So in particular, we'll ignore some branches of computation that um, make the wrong non-deterministic choices and end up dying. So let's see what happens on the test 
string A, A, B, C, C. As we go through this automaton, we're going to start in state Q1, as always, our start state, where we have nothing on our stack. We'll then move from state Q1 to Q2. So we'll end up in state Q2 with a dollar sign on our stack. Now, we're creating some non-deterministic branches that go to states Q3 and Q5, but those will end up dying because the next the next symbol on our input is an A, and there's no outgoing edges on A's from those states. So the only branch that is going to survive is the one that decides to hang out and read in two A's. So we'll go to state Q2, push an A onto the stack, Q2 again, push a second A onto the stack, and at this point, um, in this case, our number of A's and C's are the same. So we'll follow the branch that takes a non-deterministic choice, uh, takes an epsilon edge from Q2 to Q5. Uh, once we're in Q5, we will pop off 1B. That leaves the stack unchanged, but it moves the input up. So we're now looking at um, looking at a C, we then move from Q5 to Q6, make that non-deterministic guess. Uh, there was a branch that took that edge earlier, but that branch died because they weren't yet looking at a C in the input string. So Q6, the stack is still AA dollar sign. I'll continue in a second table. We're going to go from Q6 to Q6. Each time we will weed in a C and we will pop an A off the stack. So we'll go to Q6, have an A dollar sign left on the stack, Q6, and just a dollar sign left on the stack. Finally, our stack is exhausted. We can take our final edge from Q6 to Q7, pop the dollar sign off the stack. The stack is empty. Uh, it's not strictly required, by the way the stack is empty when we finish a push down automaton computation. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with it being empty, certainly tidy. And at this point, we have now not only ended up in an accept state, but we've read every input symbol. So we will accept. That's the execution of this particular push down automaton on the string AABCC, or at least we've tracked one branch of the non-deterministic computation from start to finish and shown yes. Yeah, that will accept. All right. So that is our push down automaton review for the day. Um, I think I'm going to continue this in the same video segment, but if you want to take a break, now's a good time to pause because we are immediately going to jump into our proof that push down automata recognize the context free languages. So we'll start just by writing down the definition so everything's on this one page. So we'll recall a language is context-free um, if and only if, so by definition a language is context-free if some context-free grammar uh, describes it. Describes it, derives it, same thing, I guess. So we'll show the following theorem. The theorem says a language is context-free Uh, 
uh, if and only if some push down automaton recognizes it. So this will follow from two claims. So, well, not two claims, two lemata. or lemmas if you like English plural. Lemata is the Greek plural. Lemma one says, give me any CFG, every co any context-free grammar. I can show you how to turn it into a pushdown automaton. So equivalently, if a language is context-free, Some PDA recognizes it. Lemma two is just the other direction from PDAs to CFGs. And this lemma says if a PDA recognizes some language. That language is context free. So, not unlike our proof that um, NFAs or regular expressions recognize precisely the regular languages, we've got some new class of languages, the context free languages. We know that every context free language is described by some grammar, and we can go back and forth between the grammar and a pushdown automaton that's equivalent. So what that means is if a pushdown automaton recognizes some language, that language is context-free and vice versa. I'll put this big theorem in a box. And draw some arrows. Man, that's an ugly arrow. Give me a second to fix that crime. There we go. Lemma one and lemma two imply that theorem. And we'll just jump in. We'll prove lemma one. Then I think we'll probably take a break and we'll prove lemma two in the next segment. Because it's a lot to digest at once and the pieces are relatively separate. So, how are we going to prove this? first lemma. Well, the idea is to prove the first lemma, call it lemma one, call it by its name, to prove lemma one, convert a generic CFG to a push down automata. Um, context free grammars uh, derive every string through a series of substitutions, right? That's just, that's just how they work. That's their definition. They derive every string from a series of substitution rules. We'll show a PDA that non-deterministically guesses which variable to substitute And, well, it may not guess the variable. 
and they said, let's draw the variables in a certain order. So I'll say, to be more precise, um, we'll show a PDA that non-deterministically guesses which rule to use. So it'll be simultaneously um, gaming out the derivation of every single string that's drivable from our CFG. I will guess all leftmost derivations. And then check if any matches the input string. So um, essentially what's going to happen is our context-free grammar um, generates every string by some series of substitution rules. Uh, every string derived has some leftmost derivation. So our push down automaton is going to use its stack to keep track of the string of variables in terminal. Uh, it's going to non-deterministically guess how to substitute all these variables to generate all the leftmost derivations at once. And it can do that without even caring about the input string. So simultaneously, it's going to take the string on the input and see if it matches any of the derivations. If it matches any one of them, well, then that string is in the language, so our PDA will accept. So I'll make that a little bit more precise. Draw a couple pictures. So here's how our PDA will work. Uh, first, we'll push dollar sign and the start symbol. So I'll track for each of these steps uh, what will be on the stack and what will be on the input tape. So let's say, you know, we'll consider PDA operation on the language L, zero to the N pound one to the N for some N greater than or equal to zero. And the string zero pound one. Um, given the grammar, G equals A to zero, A one or pound or L. Okay, so what are we doing here? We have some grammar G. G consists of one rule. We take the start symbol A and we replace it with 0A1. We do that some number of times. So we have an equal number of O's on the left and one's on the right. And then eventually we finish with a pound sign. So this is a grammar for the language L equals zero to the N pound one to the N for some N greater than or equal to zero this language, and we are going to show how our PDA will work when it reads in this string and simulates this grammar. So let's do that. We begin by pushing a dollar sign in the start symbol. So at step one, we have a dollar sign on the bottom of the stack and the start symbol, A, on the top of the stack. We've also got an input tape where we're trying to see, should we accept the string zero pound one? I'll throw a little arrow to show that at the moment, our pushdown automaton is reading zero. Now, what are we gonna do? 
we're going to non-deterministically guess all the derivations and we're going to keep them on our stack. So step two, uh, if the top of the stack is a variable, non-deterministically, choose a substitution rule and implement it. So in our example, let's suppose we choose the substitution rule A to 0, A1. We could also choose A to count. Um, but in this case, we'll just track the branch of our computation that guesses the right one. So our pushdown automaton is going to replace the A on top of the stack with um, 0A1. And we still haven't read any input, so we're still looking at the first string, first symbol of our input string. Next, um, if the top of the stack is a terminal, read an input character. If it matches, the stack pop the stack. If not, the branch dies. So in this case, what we'll do is the top of the stack is a zero. So our PDA it's going to pop a zero from the top of the stack and read in the character zero from the input and now we are effectively checking to see so once we're in this state here with zero a one on our stack uh, any string we derive from here is going to have a zero at the far left so uh, we can remove that zero from the top of our stack by just checking, hey, does it match the input string? Does our input string also have a zero on the far left? If not, the branch will die. But if yes, we can move on to checking if the next symbol is a pound sign, we can pop the zero off the stack. So we'll just repeat steps two and three until the branch dies, or we see the dollar sign. So in particular, now I'm going to, I have a variable at the top of my stack. I have an A at the top of my stack. So I'll follow rule two. If the top of the stack is a variable, I'll non-deterministically choose a substitution rule and implement it. So we'll choose a to pound, just because we're thinking about the non-deterministic branch that guesses correctly. Um, The next two characters on the stack are terminal symbols. So we will just pop them off and check that the next two characters on the input string match them, which indeed they do. So after the next step, we'll have a one on the stack and we'll be looking at a third symbol on the input string 
And finally, we'll be down to just dollar sign. We will have read the entire input. Um, finally, accept if all input has been read. So maybe you can see if you follow these five steps on the right that some non-deterministic branch is going to attempt to derive every string in this language. If we're non-deterministically choosing any substitution rule for the variable on top of the stack um, and we're popping off terminals as we see them on the left if they match our input string, um, if we had 000 pound 111 or some other string in the language as our input, uh, some branch would generate that string. Generate a zero, track an input zero, generate another zero, track an input zero, um, eventually find the pound symbol at the right time, transform A into pound, and then match up the one. And if not, all the branches are going to die. So, that is what our PDA will do. That's how it'll work. Next, I just have to show you how to build it so it works this way. So let's do that. Um, this is lemma one. If a language is context-free, some pushdown automaton recognizes it. So, proof. Let's let G be a context-free grammar. will show how to build an equivalent PDA P equals the following six tuple, Q, sigma, capital gamma, delta, Q start, and F. So as usual, this is a constructive proof. I'm going to show you how to build a PDA and then um, I'm going to argue relatively informally, just for time and space, that this pushdown automaton does indeed recognize that that's the same language. So here's what our pushdown automaton is going to look like. Um, it's going to have just three main states. And we're going to build it so it implements the rules we've described above. We'll start at the start state. We'll push on a dollar sign. And then we're in a loop state that I'll call Q loop. And the job of the loop state is just to non-deterministically get all possible derivations. And all of these derivations will be centered on the loop state. In particular, hang out in the loop state until we turn all of the variables on our stack into um, all the variables on our stack into terminals. And I spoke just now, we do want to push on a dollar sign, but we also want to push the start symbol of our context tree grammar. That way we have a variable to work with when we're starting. So we'll have a bunch of rules in our state Q loop. So in particular, we'll have a rule that takes the variable A and turns it into a string of variables and terminals W for every rule A to W in our rule set. So this is 
going to do exactly what we've said above. We'll take this variable A it's on top of our stack and we'll non-deterministically get some rule to follow. Um, we don't actually have Um, this isn't actually a well-defined rule as written yet, just because I've said um, push a string of variables in terminal. Strictly speaking, we're only allowed to push one symbol, but we'll come back to that. It turns out that this is just an abbreviation for a very simple construction that'll push a bunch of things onto the stack, um, just using more states. We'll also add a rule. where for every terminal, if we see a terminal on top of the stack, we'll attempt to read a terminal from the input string at the same time as we pop that terminal off the stack. So this will ensure that we follow the steps we outlined above. Uh, we'll start with our start variable and we'll non-deterministically get some derivation. We'll take that start variable and we'll follow some rule We'll follow all the rules and replace it with some legitimate string of variables and terminals. If there's a variable on the top, we'll keep doing it. So there's a terminal on the top. If there's a terminal on the top, we'll see if it matches our input string and pop it. Um, whenever we end up with a terminal on top of our input, of our stack that doesn't match the terminal at the beginning of our input string, that branch will die. Now, finally, Um, we may get down to the bottom of our stack. At that point, see our dollar sign again, we'll pop it off, and we'll finish up at our accept state. That's the entire, um, entire skeleton, at least. We still have this string pushing problem, but that's the entire skeleton of our push down automaton. So, um, of course, if we still have some input to be read, then we'll reject after we get the queue accept. But suppose, say, suppose we reach queue accept with no more input to read, then we must have generated and popped precisely the input string. In other words, if we accept the string was derived the whole from the start symbol. Likewise, suppose we get as input a string that's derivable from the start symbol, capital S. Then there exists some derivation for S, some branch reaches to accept. In other words, we'll consider the branch of computation that guesses the right substitution rule. And I claim that that'll produce a leftmost derivation for our string S. It'll pop off terminal whenever terminals are generated at the beginning of the string. It'll substitute variables whenever there are variables at the leftmost end of the string. And eventually it'll reach the accept state having matched every um, symbol in the input with some generated terminal. So this is very informal. argument that P 
recognizes same language as G. The last step is just to fill in the details. So um, there's two details in particular that we should go over. Detail one is um, how do we push strings? Well, I claim we can push S equals S1, S2, dot, 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 Sn, where each Si is some symbol in the stack alphabet as follows. We just um, we just create sequence of states that eventually pushes, oh, I'm sorry, written these backwards. We don't want to pop these symbols, we want to push them on the stack. There we go. Um, if we want to push a string, we can just add a whole string of dummy states, each of which pushes one symbol. Um, we'll only be able to traverse this so a branch of computation will only travel from left to right on this string of states if we push every character in the string. So that will allow us to fill in this particular detail uh, where I've said, if we read in a variable, we push a string. We'll just plug in those states and push in um, every individual symbol of the string. So there will be some more states in our final PDA. They're just not very important because they only get used in these one transition. So that's detail one. Um, detail two is what does the transition function look like? Formally. So I claim that if you wanted to make this construction formal, uh, it wouldn't be very hard. Uh, in particular, this F is just to accept. What we're doing here is we are making the formal notation match up with our picture. Q start is just Q start. Uh, sigma and um, sigma and gamma are just sigma and the set of variables plus the set of terminals and the set of states is just to start to loop to accept and all the other states we need to make this construction work. So the tricky part is delta and I want to write out what delta is here for us. So um, delta from Q start So I'm writing this as so I'm saying if we're at Q start, don't read in anything, don't pop anything, but go to Q loop, push the dollar sign on, and push capital S on. Uh, and implicitly, I'm using our construction above 
to push these two symbols at once. From Q loop, uh, if I can pop a variable from the top of the stack, then I want to go to a whole set of states. I want to stay in Q loop, but I want to push onto the stack a string of variables and terminals W for all rules A to W for all rules A to W in R. So that'll take that'll take care of my variable rule. Uh, I also want from Q loop to pop and match terminal. So I'll say for every terminal symbol. If I see a terminal symbol on the top of the stack, I want to create an edge that reads that same terminal symbol in from the input. And I do not push anything onto the stack. That'll keep track of my first edges from Q start to Q loop and from Q loop to Q loop. Finally, I go from Q loop and it's possible to pop a dollar sign from the stack. I go to the accept state. And then I'll say delta is matched to the null state. So we'll finish up our proof there. Um, this is more or less a sketch. So I'll refer you to uh, section 2.2 sister for full details. need to know just how to convert CFG to PDA. So what we've just done is we've outlined a procedure for taking in any context free grammar and building a push down automaton that recognizes the same language. So we push on the start symbol, we non-deterministically substitute symbol, and we check against the input string. Uh, any one of our branches generates precisely the input string we'll accept. Um, we've sketched out the logic for why this new PDA will recognize precisely the same language as the original grammar generates. And we've written down a specification for the transition function in case that's convenient for you to um, add an addition to the state diagram above. So again, uh, because we went through it in not incredible detail, I don't expect you to uh, have the entire proof down in full formality. But the thing I do want you to be on top of is this procedure for converting a context-free grammar to a push-down automaton. That's the core bit. So that's the bit we're going to do a quick example of right now. So let's do an example. Um, from a context-free grammar to a push-down automaton. So we'll consider the following grammar. The grammar G, which goes from the start symbol S to A T B or just B, and from T the TA or the empty string. So we've got several rules there, two variables, S and T. And we're just going to show how to draw a state diagram for a PDA that matches this. So in particular, uh, the skeleton of our state diagram is very simple. We have a start state, a loop state, 
and then accept state. Uh, from the start to the loop, we'll just push on the dollar sign. And from the loop to the accept state, we'll pop off the dollar sign again. The only tricky bit is the derivation in the middle. So the call that we need to add rule to substitute each variable and match each terminal. And it's actually relatively straightforward. So in particular, what do we do if we see the variable x on top of the stack? Well, in that case, we'll pop off x and we'll push ATB to replace it or we'll push B to replace it. If we see T on top of the stack, we will push on TA to replace it, or we'll push on the empty string to replace it. Uh, finally, if we see A or B, these two terminals on the top of the stack, we'll attempt to read in an A or a B from the input string. And our branch of computation will die if we fail to read in the same terminal symbol on the input as we've read, as we've just popped off the stack, because that means that our derivation has gone awry. So this is complete, except for one thing, this fact of pushing strings which we can um, expand as follows. So in particular, I'm just going to draw a picture of Q loop here. Um, we can do the move S to ATB as follows. So we want to push on the B first. So we'll have an edge that pops the S pushes on a B, a second edge that does nothing but push on the T, and a third edge that does nothing but push on the A. So I hope you're convinced that if you go around that loop, you will pop off an S and then push on a B, then a T, then an A, and you'll do the equivalent of this pop rule. So this pop rule is equivalent to this little chain right here. Uh, similarly, if we want to turn a T into a TA, we will uh, read in a T to push an A, and then we will push on another T. So um, our entire push down automaton is just is just the picture above that goes from Q start to Q loop to Q accept, where we substitute start edges for the gadgets below. Uh, now, finally, we'll do a quick example of the string in this grammar. Well, I guess we can go S to ATB or to B and then T to TA or the empty string. So let's do this example. The string AAB is in this grammar because we can go S to ATB, substitute T for TA, we have A, T, A, B, and then substitute T for the empty string. So we have A, A, B. 
if we wanted to follow that derivation through our pushdown automaton, we could do it as follows. So as usual, we'll track the state and we'll track the stack. Start, and queue start with nothing on our stack. We'll go to queue loop and we'll push on. Um, oops. I'm sorry, I should have noted that. Um, we don't just push on a dollar sign, we push on the start symbol and a dollar sign. I'm sure some of you have been screaming at the screen for five minutes. Um, why don't you push on the start symbol? You do push on the start symbol. My bad there. Um, so after that, our stack will have the start symbol and a dollar sign. Um, this is, of course, equivalent to two states where we first push on the dollar sign and then we push on the start symbol. So we've abbreviated that chunk as well. Um, so now we are in queue loop. We've pushed on S and the dollar sign. Uh, one branch will non-deterministically guess that we'll substitute S for ATB. So we'll go from queue loop to queue loop. We'll go around this chain of edges and we'll end up with A, T, B, dollar sign. At that point, we have an A, so we'll push A and we'll read in an A from the input string. So we're now at Q, Q loop and we have T, B, dollar sign. Uh, we'll use our rule to substitute T for T, A. So we'll go around the red loop. T A B dollar sign. Then we'll substitute T for the empty string. So that'll look like this particular edge. So we'll have Q loop, A B dollar sign. We'll, we'll match the remaining A's and B's from our input string. So Q loop, B dollar sign, Q loop, just dollar sign. And then finally, we have now read in every input symbol we will pop off the dollar sign and end up in the accept state with our stack. So um, that is our example of how to turn this particular grammar into a pushdown automaton. And we've tracked one string through the pushdown automaton. Um, we've just followed the particular non-deterministic choices that generate this string. Uh, if you looked at all the branches, you could see other potential derivations that would start out, uh, but these branches would die either when they failed to match up some terminal or when they got to the accept state with some input symbols still to read. Um, and hopefully walking through that example has convinced you that by following QLoop, some non-deterministic branch could derive any particular string derivable from this grammar using the start symbol. And would match that string on the input. So uh, thank you guys for your patience. That's a long proof. It's a construction that I think is cool, but it's definitely a technical one. So if you had trouble with it, no worries. If you thought it was cool, glad you thought it was cool. Um, next, we'll see a sketch of how to go from a PDA to a context-free grammar. We'll do it in a little bit less detail because we're going to have just a little bit to get to the end of the lecture with time to spare. And we'll also see non-context free languages. So thanks for watching. Uh, see you in the next video.